Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Mary and Casey for her kindness in inviting me to be part of this symposium. It's not often I find myself in, myself in such distinguished company. I've been warned to be brief, and I'll do my best to follow that advice. I always try to be brief ever since I heard a story about an after-dinner speaker in Ireland who failed to heed that advice. This person went on and on and on and wouldn't shut up. <laughs> he drove everybody in the room to distraction. Or well, since this was Ireland, he drove them to drink, literally. <laughs> they drained every bottle of wine on the tables. Finally, one person could stand it no longer. He got up, grabbed an empty wine bottle, went up to the head table. He stood behind the speaker and took a swing at him with the bottle. But he missed the speaker and he hit the person sitting next to the speaker. <laughs> and as this person was falling to the ground, he said, hit me again, I can still hear him. <laughs> <laughs> I would not want to provoke an incident like that here this morning. <laughs> I thought what I would speak about this morning is something different from the topics covered by my colleagues. Rather than talk about the legal complexities of People v. Phillips, I wanted to concentrate on the Catholic community in New York in 1813. And there are three aspects of that that I thought might be of interest to you. First of all, the origin and composition of the Catholic community. Secondly, the, the prominent role played by the laity, as is evidenced in the role of the lay trustees of St. Peter's Church. And thirdly, what I find really fascinating is this. It was the secrecy surrounding the sacramental confession that brought together Catholics and Protestants in that famous court case. I find that fascinating because two, two decades later, the secrecy surrounding confession was a major source of suspicion of Catholicism on the part of many Protestants. That represents a, a great change. First of all, the Catholic community in New York City in 1813. I would like to point out it was only 30 years old. Prior to 1783, Catholics could not organize and practice their religion publicly, as Professor Duncan and Professor Nelson have pointed out to us. It was only in 1783 when the British Army evacuated the city and then the following year, the state legislature repealed the anti-priest law of 1700. It was only then that Catholics could form and organize their own community. And it was the laity, not the clergy, who did that. In 1785, a group of Catholic laymen formed a corporation, acquired property from Trinity Episcopal Church, and started a subscription fund to build St. Peter's Church. And it's known as, I say, it was the lady, not the clergy, who organized St. Peter's Church. There was no priest on the scene, and there was no Catholic bishop anywhere in the United States. It's pleasant to report that two of the people who headed that subscription list were George Clinton, the governor of New York, and James Duane, the mayor of New York City. Both of them were Protestants of Irish background. So, it's the beginning of a, a friendship and mutual support between Catholics and Protestants in New York City that would surface again in 1813 with that famous court case. The first pastor of St. Peter's Church was an Irish Capuchin and a former chaplain in the French Navy, Father Charles Whalen. He estimated there were about 200 Catholics in New York City. Only about 20 of them were regular churchgoers. It was a surprisingly cosmopolitan congregation. Most of the parishioners, as you might expect, were Irish, but they were also, but, but Whalen said there were six languages commonly spoken by the parishioners, English, German, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Irish. Despite the presence of a few wealthy merchants, most of these parishioners were poor. Father Whalen said, they were not only poor, but desperately poor. That's borne out by the fact it would take 25 years before Catholics in New York would build a second church. 
what today is known as the Basilica of St. Patrick's Old Cathedral. And incidentally, the person largely responsible for that church was Father Anthony Coleman, the Alsatian Jesuit who figures so prominently in people V. Phillips and who was in many ways the real founder of the Diocese of New York. The New York Catholic community grew rapidly in the 19th century, so much so that by the end of the Civil War, the majority of the population of New York City, which of course then was just Manhattan, the majority of the population may very well have been Catholic. By 1880, there was a Catholic mayor in New York City. By the early 20th century, New York Catholics had acquired so much political influence that the Archbishop's residence at 452 Madison Avenue was commonly referred to as the powerhouse. But as Yogi Berra might have said, that was all in the future <laughs> in 1813. In 1813, there wasn't the slightest hint you know, that the Catholics of New York City had such a bright future ahead of them. At the time of that famous court case, the Catholic community in New York City was small, poor, relatively powerless, and extremely grateful for the support that it received from friendly Protestants like William Sanson, Dewitt Clinton, and Richard Riker. A second aspect of this Catholic community I wanted to mention is the prominent role of the laity, especially the trustees of St. Peter's Church. And that may strike you as strange because it's so different from the scene today. But for the first 50 years of the American Republic, the Catholic laity were a power in the land, or at least in the governance of their own parishes. Virtually every parish had a board of trustees who were elected annually by the laity. I hasten to add the system was not as democratic as it may seem, <laughs> because the only, only the wealthier parishioners, those who rented pews, were able to vote in the annual election of the trustees. The reputation of the lay trustees has suffered, has not fared very well in the history of American Catholicism. As you know, history is usually written by the winners, not by the losers. And in the struggle between the laity and the clergy in 19th century America for the leadership of the Catholic Church, it was the clergy who won and won an overwhelming victory uh, against the laity. As a consequence, until very recently, the history of the Catholic Church in this country has been written largely by clerical historians. And they either minimize the contribution of the laity, or in some cases actually demonize them because of their role as lay trustees in their parishes. For example, the first real history of the Archdiocese of New York appeared in 1908 on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the diocese was written by a local pastor named John Talbot Smith. He vilified the pew holders who elected the trustees in the strongest terms. They very often professed the faith with their mouths but lived the lives of pagans, Talbot Smith said about these people. He said, these parishioners were filled with heretical notions and admired ultra-Protestant customs. That would not be, well, it's extreme, but it's not, you know, so, totally out of the mainstream of the way the lay trustees were presented in American Catholic history. In 1983, a popular history of the Archdiocese was written by another New York priest, Florence Cohallan. In his treatment of People v. Phillips, he never mentions the trustees for St. Peter's Church. He attributes the favorable outcome entirely to Father Coleman. He never mentions the trustees. I would say that's clerical history with a vengeance. <laughs> you know, lay trustees have often been criticized for their harsh treatment of their parish clergy. But in some instances, at least, their harsh treatment may have been justified because of the unsavory character of some of these priests. In 1837, for example, Bishop John Dubois, the aging French-born Bishop of New York, asked the coadjutor bishop in Philadelphia Francis Patrick Kenrick, to come to New York and, be, and serve as his coadjutor. Kenrick refused, and the reason he gave was this. He said he had dismissed a number of priests in Philadelphia. He fired them, and Dubois had taken them in to New York. 
He said, I don't think they would be happy to see me come to New York. <laughs> and he also said, he, this is in a letter to Paul Cullen, director of the Irish College in Rome. He said he had dismissed these priests op crimina because of criminal misbehavior. Well, consider the situation in St. Joseph's Church a few blocks from here. St. Joseph's Church on 6th Avenue, it was the scene of many conflicts between clergy and the lay trustees. One point the parish was placed under interdict. But the blame may not be entirely due to the lay trustees. For example, in September 1845, John Hughes fired the pastor of St. Joseph's Church, the ineffable Ambrose Manahan, and he sent him a classic letter. He said, I advise you to ask for your exeat and to get, a, get out of my diocese as quickly as possible. <laughs> he said, in the almost extinguished hope that on a new scene where your future character will be determined by your future conduct, you may disappoint the melancholy anticipations that the past is too well calculated to inspire. <laughs> no, I say that's a mouthful. <laughs> In recent years, historians like David O'Brien, who taught for many years at the College of the Holy Cross, and Patrick Carey of Marquette University, have set the record straight about lay trusteeism. They pointed out that in many places, the system worked very well. And, this, and it gave dedicated laymen the opportunity to make a valuable contribution to American Catholicism. One of the many valuable features of this symposium, I would suggest, is the fact that this symposium has reinforced this revisionist interpretation of the role of the lay trustees by pointing out the prominent role they played in that famous court case in 1813. In New York, the role of the lay trustees was effectively quashed in 1838 with the appointment of John Hughes who as the assistant to the aging French bishop, John Dubois. Hughes became an iconic figure in New York Catholic history, and rightly so. He was rightly revered by his immigrant flock because of the way he defended them and championed their interests against nativist bigotry. However, there was also a dark and unpleasant side to Hughes's character. Hughes was a born autocrat who would tolerate no opposition from either the clergy or the laity. He told the clergy at one clergy conference, if you want canon law, then go to France or Spain where it exists. He said, here I am lord and master, and we don't need canon law. <laughs> when two Irish priests complained that he had violated their rights in canon law, he said, I'll teach you County Monaghan canon law and send you back to the bogs whence you came. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not funny. John Larkin of the Society of Jesus, the president of St. John's College at Fordham, he said of Hughes, I quote, he, was, he is a violent man and a stubborn one, and neither reason nor law have any weight against his will. It was only a matter of time before Hughes had a clash with the lay trustees. And the blow up occurred on Sunday evening, February 24th, 1839, in St. Patrick's Old Cathedral, before a gathering of some 600 people, including the trustees of the cathedral. The background to this meeting was an incident that occurred two weeks earlier, when the trustees of the cathedral called in the police to remove a Sunday school teacher from the classroom, a Sunday school teacher whom Bishop Dubois had appointed. You said to Dubois, you, have to stay, you can't stand for this. He said, if the trustees can remove a teacher from the classroom, they can remove a priest from the sanctuary. The upshot two weeks later was this meeting in the old cathedral before 600 people. It was the kind of scene that Hughes loved. It gave him the opportunity to do two things he loved to do, to talk and to fight. <laughs> uh, he went right for the jugular. He compared, the, and it was you know, shameless demagoguery, he compared the trustees to the British authorities in Ireland. <laughs> and he said, he told his, his listeners, the, sacred, the sainted spirits of your ancestors are looking down on you from heaven. 
They're ready to disavow and disown you. If you allow pygmies among yourselves to filter away the rights of the church, which your glorious ancestors would not yield but with their lives to the persecuting giant of the British Empire, you get the drift of his remarks. <laughs> it was sheer demagoguery, but it was very effective. You said by the time he finished speaking, many of the people were weeping like children. And here's the real kicker. And then he said, I wasn't far from tears myself. <laughs> That's after listening to his own rhetoric. <laughs> Say the result of Hughes' performance was the rout of the trustees of the cathedral parish, and shortly thereafter, the end of lay trusteeism in New York. I don't mention this to praise Hughes, but to criticize him, because, he, because of his overbearing authoritarianism. He had a legitimate grievance against the lay trustees for firing this Sunday school teacher. But he turned it into a full court press against the very existence of lay trustees. By rejecting any collaboration with the laity, he made it virtually impossible for them to do what the trustees of St. Peter's did in 1813 in that famous court case. Let me finish. I said that it was ironic that the defense of the seal of confession was the issue that brought together Catholics and Protestants in 1813. 20 years later, a full-blown anti-Catholic movement was sweeping the country, much of it fueled by the huge number of Catholic immigrants. And that continued until the Civil War. The most famous historian of that movement, Ray Allen Billington, he called it the Protestant Crusade. And he identified the 1830s as the decade that saw the emergence of these professional anti-Catholic bigots. And there were two things they zeroed in on to arouse Protestant sus suspicion of Catholics. One was convents, the other was confession. Both of them were shrouded in secrecy, both were unfamiliar to Protestants, both could easily be portrayed as a centers of debauchery. Bogus nuns appeared on the lecture circuit describing the horrors of convent life. Perhaps the most famous of those imposters was Mariah Monk, whose awful revelations was published here in New York City in 1836. It sold 300,000 copies before the Civil War. Billington referred to it as the Uncle Tom's Cabin of Know Nothingism. Along with these stories of the immoral activities in convents, want the stories about confession and how the secrecy of confession was availed for priests you know, to seduce innocent young women. By the 1830s, a gullible public readily believed much of this propaganda. They came to view confession as an intrinsically evil institution that demanded government intervention to protect defenseless females from rapacious Romish priests. It was a very different world from the world that produced that famous court case in 1813. At this point, I think a quotation from scripture would be appropriate. Hmm. I would like to make my own. The words of the risen Lord to his disciples, when he said, I have many more things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. Thank you. 